Hey, everybody, this is Jeffrey Snover. Um, welcome to psconf.eu. Today I'm joined for the State of the Sh Shell talk with... This is Joey Aiello, uh, PM of PowerShell. Really glad to be here for the first ever virtual State of the Shell. Hey, so let's show them the slide deck. This let's is our it. first time doing it, so we'll have some errors. We're going to have some fun. Uh, so us. many great things to talk to you about. And by the way, sorry we couldn't see you there in person. That's always the best part of it. But we got some great content here today. All right, so we're going to talk to you about the state of the shell. Lots of exciting stuff to discuss. First, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our sponsors. Without you, uh, this would not be possible. So thank you, sponsors. Let's talk about it. COVID-19, right? Wow, wow, wow. So safety first. Thank you. you know, please take care of your families. Take care of yourselves. Take care of your employees. Take care of your coworkers. Check in on them. See how they're doing. This is a very stressful time. Give people uh, a lot of slack. Um, forgive uh, uh, errors, et cetera. We're all in new territory. Well, it's really exciting times, right? Uh, we're forging new paths, forging new work patterns, et cetera. Um, but here's the thing I want to point out. The world always has been, it is, and it always will be a messy place. I've said that from the very beginning. And so in this time, it is an era that really highlights the importance of what we've been saying all along how important it is to be adaptable, how important it is to be resilient, to be robust, to have automation, right? To be anti-fragile, right? Anti-fragile says, oh, hey, I can take a hit and keep on going. I can have, uh, I get stronger under stress. And I'm going to tell you a story about that and how automation and the things we've been talking about forever are the things that really help during these stressful times. So really what I'm kind of foreshadowing is, is these turbulent times, produce new heroes and guess what those new heroes are the folks that can that can help us overcome these times and you are the that that category of people so this is what i like to call the f5 moment or the hit refresh moment right and so Sanchez is very clear on this he says look the world's going into a a global recession potentially even a depression and that there are companies that can survive this and there are companies that can thrive at the other end of that and what you have to do is you have to hit this refresh right you've got to um you've got to be good you got to be excellent at the things that are critical and then you need to figure out what's important at the other end and then invest in those things okay so this is the time to think through all of the things that you're doing all the things you're doing in your work practices, all the way you manage the systems and figure out the things that serve you and the things that do not. And you need to drop the things that do not serve you and invest in those things that do, okay? So, and of, of course, we are thankful, thankful, thankful. Thankful for uh, Tobias for setting this up. Uh, thankful that we have the opportunity to work in an industry that can work remotely. Uh, most of us can do that. Uh, you know, it's, we are very blessed to be able to do this. Right. So a few weeks ago, as you probably saw, there's been a surge in remote or distributed work from home. Uh, teams had unbelievable growth. So what does this headline say? Teams usage up by 12 million in the past week. So imagine that. Oh, hey, uh, by the way, uh, in the next week, we're going to add 12 million users to your service. What? 12 million users. So people that had not had teams got teams. People that had teams uh, and weren't using it started to use it. People who were using it now used it all day long. So the surge on demand, this is not just about 12 million new users, but the volume of Teams usage just skyrocketed in an incredibly short period of time. During that time, Microsoft and sorry, PowerShell was very, very, very helpful to Microsoft Teams. So during this time, there was such a huge surge, I was recruited to become the uh, executive incident manager for our expansion in Teams, our expansion of Teams in Europe. Right. Uh, things were uh, growing at an incredible pace. Honestly, the wheels got a little wobbly. Um, and so they asked the, us to recruit. So I was on, on the phone uh, 3 a.m. a couple nights uh, 
it was pretty tough. Anyway, so the thing that really struck me was over and over again, as they were dealing with this incident and then the next incident and the next incident is blah, blah, blah. Oh, I ran this PowerShell script and da, da, da. Oh, I ran this PowerShell script, da, da, da. Here, I wrote this PowerShell script, da, da, da. So basically PowerShell was everywhere. It was freaking cool, right? And they were using it for diagnostics. They were doing it for operations. They were using it to repair systems, to provision new systems, to deprovision systems. Freaking PowerShell was everywhere. Very, very cool. And in this time, the verbosity and the clarity of PowerShell was so helpful. Look, I don't know anything about Teams. I'm the incident executive incident manager. So I'm there trying to keep track of what's going on, et cetera. And I'd see, oh, here's this PowerShell script that they're running. And you can just look at the name and know what it's doing, right? Uh, if I had to open up those scripts and take a look at what was going on, the verbosity and the clarity of what's going on would have been so helpful. You know, I was telling Joey the other day, was, you know, like, imagine that you're, you're it's a bad day, something's really stressful, and you open up a, a script and it's Pearl, right? <laughs> you know, that's going to be a bad night. Yeah, tough luck, yeah. <laughs> exactly, tough luck. Uh, so it's very helpful. Now, the interesting thing about this is we were both automating up and automating down, which is to say, to scale up all these systems to, for all the demand, well, where are you getting all those CPUs? So simultaneously of scaling up new things, we had to tear down other things to reuse that capacity. And again, PowerShell was used everywhere. So ultimately this was wildly successful. And here is the point, here is the point. When you got your automation down, when you got your DevOps Kung Fu and you, you know, mastered it, you're able to take these incredible hits to the system, incredible changes, incredible challenges, and it just works, right? This is not a time, can you imagine, click, 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 you know, like get in the mouse, like click, 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 like no, 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 never would have worked, never would have worked. Automation was the key. So Klauswitz, right? Klauswitz once said, hey, to secure peace is to prepare for war, okay? For us, for us, to secure calm is to prepare for drama, right? You gotta prepare for drama and then things were calm. You know, Teams, Office, uh, Exchange, spent the last decade preparing for drama. Everything was automated. And so when the craziness came, it was pretty calm. Yes, things got wobbly, but I'm telling you, it got wobbly because the volume was so large. But by and large, you know, a little blip, and then things have been going fantastic since then. So here's the punchline. PowerShell 7 has been this 20-year story of preparing you for this drama. Really, it has. So let's talk a little bit about that. First, I'll give you a hint. The Don Jones, a number of uh, the early PowerShell team have been uh, uh, reached out uh, by Don Jones. He connected with us. He's been doing a whole series of, of conversations and interviews, and he's putting it in a book, getting uh, the shell of the shell of an idea. Uh, it's I think it's a pretty good book. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, but I'll tell you, this is this tells the full and complete story of how we birthed the idea, some of the personalities, some of the inside baseball of getting this idea off the ground, the source of a lot of the ideas. Look, a lot of people think, oh, Jeffrey Snover, PowerShell. No, 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 no. Don, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Bruce Payette, Jim Truer, Ken Hansen, um, you know, Halal Al Hali, uh, Charlie Chase, and so many others. There were all these fantastic ideas, all these fantastic engineers that got together, uh, worked together as a team. The conflicts that we had, you know, the fights that we had, and then the principles by which we were able to put it all together and have all the IQs add up. Um, and it's all in this this story. So if you're interested in the story, it's not a technical book, um, but it's a it's a pretty fun read, I think. So it all kind of grounds in our core value proposition, right? The, the what we call the sacred vow. And again, I'd ask you, how many other you know technology providers give you a sacred vow, right? Sacred vow, that's kind of a big deal. Okay. So our sacred vow to you is that you learn PowerShell and your value will continue to appreciate 
over time that we're going to invest and we're going to invest and we're going to invest and we're going to make sure that you become successful and you become valuable and that this is a great deal for you. Okay. Joey, why don't you take over the evolution of PowerShell? Yeah, thanks so much, Jeffrey. So I, I've been fortunate enough to to get to work to uh, with a bunch of the folks uh, that that Jeffrey mentioned before on that that uh, you know history of PowerShell shell of an idea, and so you know I've gotten to get a lot of insight into a lot of the philosophy behind how PowerShell came to be and and sort of the the progress and the thematic evolution uh, of PowerShell from from the early days of 1.0 you know through to seven where we are today. Um, so let's start off talking a little bit about Windows PowerShell one and two. So this is really you know, introduction of PowerShell to the world. Um, and it was all about taking these disparate sets of management technologies in Windows and Windows servers. So, you know, you had you had COM, you had WMI, you had Win32 APIs, .NET APIs were, were uh, you know, becoming bigger and bigger, uh, all these files and, and, you know, registry keys all over the place. And so PowerShell was, was able to glue all these things together in a very no drama way, a uh, very task oriented way, to give people uh, ways to to really uh, use all of these these management APIs uh, in in the same structured object oriented system, right? And again, very task oriented, so that you're able to say, hey, um, you know, I want to do this thing in Win32 and this thing in WMI, expose it as a PowerShell function, and I don't have to think about the fact that these underlying management technologies are different going forward. Now, right. of course, this is back to that theme. Sorry, this is back to that please. theme of the world was a messy place. And we're gonna we're gonna clean it up, or right? we're gonna try provide a mechanism whereby you can clean it up, make it Absolutely. consistent. Yeah, I like to call this. Uh, you know, it's a PowerShell is a glue language. You know, it's able to funnel all these things together. Um, and and as Jeffrey says, the world has always been messy and will continue to always be messy. Um, so going into the uh, you know the the 3.0 days uh, and and really carrying forward into 5.0. Oh, you know what? You didn't take control, or did you? Did you take control back? I, I did. Yeah, did. it says I'm presenting yep, it here. Um, cool. Yep, you got it. Yeah, just a slight. We, we're having fun with the tooling. You know, it's always uh, always a good time trying new stuff. Um, so uh, so, yeah, going going into the 3.0 through 5.0 days, you know, it's really all about um, working with the, the feature and role owners across Windows to introduce more and more of this task orientation as a, a pre-rolled. Uh, uh, sort of commodity to server administrators. So, you know, networking, security, identity, storage, Hyper-V, all these teams built PowerShell modules so that even if, you know, their management technologies were messy on the back end, um, you wouldn't have to think about that mess uh, in order to, to get your work done in managing these workloads. So, um, you know, you, you had Hyper-V, for instance, that, that you know, exposes .NET APIs, but also may do some stuff through WMI and SIM. And, and in order to sort of commingle those things together, uh, and, and present them to you as a single workload. Um, this was also when we introduced remoting, which really was the start of sort of a larger and larger at scale management of machines with PowerShell. Um, and uh, you'll see some, some more of that as we as we go into six. So, you know, obviously with the launch of PowerShell Core 6.x, the uh, primary theme we're focused around here was, was ubiquity, really getting PowerShell in as many places in this messy world as we possibly could. So, you know, clearly the introduction of support for Mac OS and Linux uh, meant that we were suddenly exposed to an entirely new surface area of, of messy world. Uh, but, but it also uh, marked our transition to supporting more and more uh, public clouds. So we have, you know, obviously the Azure PowerShell modules that Microsoft manages, but we worked closely with, with you know, vendors, at, uh, uh, the, the folks, excuse me, at Amazon, Google, VMware, and all these providers were able to, you know, simplify that, that mess by providing uh, these modules that could work across all of these different operating systems. Yeah, now, can Simon, I add something here? Please. You know, it is hard to overstate how much messy, hard work was done by the team in this time frame. I mean, really, it was just like, you know, we worked to do this. We had to get on .NET Core. .NET Core 1.0 had been very courageous in its refactoring. In fact, they've been overly courageous. To my knowledge, there's only been two people, two projects in the world that were successful with uh, .NET Core 1. One is this amazing game developer, Age of Ascent in, in London, and then the PowerShell team. And we had a much harder problem than the, the, the game guy, awesome as it was. We were trying to manage all this stuff. And so many times the teams said, man, this is just 
this is this is painful. We're just like working our butt off, and and we're gonna it's gonna take forever. And at the end of the day, we're just gonna be where we are. It's like no, you're not. You're gonna be able to run on nano server. You're gonna be portable, etc. And boy, the team did it. The team put in the work. And you all really, the next time you see somebody in the PowerShell team that worked on this, you should just reach out and say thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, you went through incredible amount of hard work and 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 now you're seeing 6.0 paid off you know you got all this stuff but then it laid the path to 7.0 and beyond but i just really want to say thank you to the team for putting up with well over a year of just brutal thankless work thanks jeffrey thank i you. appreciate that yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, thank really? you to the engineers that actually did that heavy lifting because it was uh, really a, a Herculean effort. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to extend the, the, the point here, um, you know, uh, another aspect here of this ubiquity was not just in driving sort of the multi-platform aspect or being in all these new new places like Docker or Nano Server or different, you know, size footprints. Uh, X copy deploy was a big one, but also being able to speak this lingua franca of the cloud world. So we're talking about, you know, REST APIs and their, you know, close cousin uh, uh, JSON and all this sort of structured data that's being emitted by those REST APIs in that format, uh, as well as SSH, which of course is the, you know, remote management technology going back uh, 20 years now uh, with the rest of the world. So it was really about just making sure that, again, we could continue to funnel more and more of that messy world into PowerShell and into a structured form. So you'll notice here, you know, there's this little part of the bubble peeking out in the lower left corner. And as Jeffrey <laughs> sort of alluded to, uh, you know, this was a lot of the refactoring being done by .NET. Um, and to their credit, you know, a, a lot of this was sort of brought back over time in a very, very, uh, you know, uh, sort of well thought out way. Um, but we did lose some of that compatibility for a brief period of time. And I know many of you struggled with moving to PowerShell Core 6 given some of the incompatibilities with the existing .NET Framework modules. So with PowerShell 7, we moved to .NET Core 3.1, which enabled us to uh, bring in more and more of these sort of traditional .NET Framework uh, Windows APIs and return a lot of those modules back to native compatibility. So, you know, we've we've now, you know, shipped a page and I'll have the link a little bit later that shows you all of the modules and windows that natively work. But in addition to that, we've also, you know, added this compatibility layer so that even for those modules that don't currently work today uh, in .NET Core, uh, which which uh, likely, unfortunately, will, will not be ported given, uh, you know, that .NET is sort of looking more towards the future now rather than some of these uh, uh, traditional APIs. Um, you can still use this compatibility layer to call into Windows PowerShell without really having to think about, you know, the fact that you have these these multiple versions of the CLR and multiple versions of PowerShell on your machine. So you really know, exciting stuff. The compatibility layer that does it a disservice. Look, here's the reality. It's just a it's just a new version of these uh, commandlets, right? I mean, look if you think about it. You, so if you're not familiar with the compatibility layer, the way it works is, hey, we go and uh, well, let's talk about WMI commandlets, right? So when you run a WMI commandlet you're not running WMI in the process. No, what happens is you run a, the, a WMI call and that then talks a protocol to a local process and then the code runs in that process. And sometimes it doesn't even run that process in WMI itself. WMI launches another process to run the code and then it marshals the results back and then back, back to you. And that's the way this works, okay? Well, that's effectively what this compatibility module is. And that's why, again, I don't like that name, but effectively what happens is you run the commandlet. And now, instead of it, what it happens is you talk to a, another process, and that other process is running Windows PowerShell 5.1, okay? And then the command runs there, and you get the results back here. So it's a, you know, completely isomorphic to WMI. It's, it's one. There is one difference, and that is uh, if the command, the 5.1 command, had produced an object that had a, a method, um, you get a deserialized object, so you don't get that method. But in reality, that's not that many, uh, so, and it works extraordinarily well. I mean, it's shockingly well. It's 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 glorious. Yeah, it's it's. it's and kind by the way, if you look, it, it is. If you're, if you're a techno geek, like look into the details of that stuff. It is so much fun. You can see it all there. You know, we create this when you do it the first time. We create a local session, and so when you say get to sessions, you'll see the session there. Yeah, and actually, I, I really love that analogy, Jeffrey. I hadn't I hadn't thought about it in comparison to WMI, but it really is 
very, very close analogy. And I also have never liked the name compatibility layer. So if you or anyone else on the chat has a, has a better name uh, yes, for that please. thing, I, I'm more than I'm more than happy to take suggestions uh, on that name. We, we've not capital C capital L uh, compatibility layer quite yet. So, uh, you know, we can we can always always adjust that uh, moving forward. But yeah, the technology itself is is pretty astoundingly uh, seamless. So continuing to move forward, um, you know, we, we just really want to talk about the gestalt here, you know, the, 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 the gist of PowerShell 7. So, you know, with Windows PowerShell, really it was all about that simple automation and management of Windows servers, right? It was all about that task orientation, stuff that traditional IT admins were doing in the GUI, that they needed to do at larger and larger scale um, and in a more, you know, custom, custom way uh, to, to automate uh, their tasks. With PowerShell Core, we enabled this universal automation and management across operating systems, across clouds. So now these tasks could span, you know, what was rapidly becoming hybrid as in uh, both on-premises and in the cloud and heterogeneous infrastructure, which was, you know, Windows and, and Linux. Uh, but with PowerShell 7, we're, we're just taking that up to the next level, right? We're enabling this automation, management, and deployment of everything hybrid uh, at larger and larger scale and complexity, right? And, and you'll see some of the themes coming out in PowerShell 7.1 that, that support this and, you know, really give just more and more simplicity to the user to be able to do uh, some of the more complex tasks uh, that, that exist in their, in their uh, infrastructure. So how did PowerShell 7.0 itself fulfill the sacred vow? How did we make, uh, you know, keep, keep our promise to you uh, that that learning PowerShell is going to continue to add value uh, uh, to that investment of having learned it. Um, first off, this was one of the huge, huge hits of 7.0 was the addition of parallelism to for each object. Uh, so for those that don't already know about this feature, we added um, a parallel flag to for each object that essentially allows um, it, it's it's using the what's called the PS thread job module under the hood, but it essentially spins up multiple run spaces and allows you to take your collection from earlier in the pipeline um, and run it within a uh, each item of that collection inside script blocks in parallel. So this actually means that uh, in in the real world where you're you know processing large logs um, or you know performing a bunch of remote rest calls to a very large set of different servers that may actually be the bottleneck um, in in the operation you're trying to run or or a vast number of other scenarios, we're seeing real world speedups of two to a hundred x. Right. I've yeah, seen scripts crazy. out in the wild that took an hour, hour 15 that are down to three and a half minutes as a result of adding one flag to for each object, which is just incredible. Right. This is absolutely huge for those of you running these long, long, long running tasks at high distribution uh, in, in your automation. Right. You're, you're saving hours and hours of time. Yeah, um, but by the way, it's not that simple. It's not that you can just put this in. Everything gets better. Should do that. It really yeah. depends upon the workload. <laughs> it really <laughs> does. Yes. And, and this is interesting because Joey and I had very different intuitions about it. At some point, we had a conflict about, uh, what are you doing that for? You know, that's the wrong number. And it turned out we had completely different cognitive models for how this was going to be used. Both of them are correct, but it's worth talking about. You want to talk about how you thought the this would be used mostly? Yeah, I, yeah. I remember so talking about the throttle you know, limit defaults. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Off. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically, the, the the what is the throttle limit? What do we go with? I I let you five. choose. Five. Okay. Yeah. I said, what are you doing? Five. It should be like five hundred or something. He's like, what are you, are you saying? And that's where it's like, wait, what? Is a smart person make all the wrong choices. What the hell's going on here? And so we explored it. Like, what? what how are you thinking about this? And so basically, the team had been thinking about this of, hey, I've got this massive machine here. You know, twelve cores, twenty cores, whatever. And I'm doing something in this loop, and and it's banging the heck out of one core while the other, you know, uh, nineteen are are cold. Right. I want to be able to like fire them all up and use all the cores on the system. It's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And that, yeah, and this that was model. this was my intuition going. How could 500 work if at my best possible machine, I've got 24 virtual cores like this is exactly what, where are you getting 500, Jeffrey? And so I've been thinking, no, 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 this is about massive uh, for each. I'm going to do work against a very large set of things uh, that have latency in them. So I'm going to do something and it's going to take a minute or, you know, 
10 seconds before it returns. At that point, I don't want to wait for it to return. I want to you know, have a bunch of them outstanding. Uh, and so this is the a way you can uh, parallelize to address latency in parallel operations. Anyway, so you can, those are the two use cases. Um, yeah, so uh, as, a, as a general intuition to just kind of reword that, you know, if you're doing things that, you know, involve, uh, again, this latency either going to a disk or more frequently going out to the network, cranking up your throttle limit uh, is something that's encouraged and that actually is going to give you a lot of a lot of speed up. But if you're doing things that are largely computational and doing processing where the bottleneck is actually the processing on your local machine, um, then that's something where, you know, you're going to want to keep that throttle limit down to something reasonable given the amount of cores that you have on the machine. You know what might be helpful is an example. So imagine you did, uh, say, uh, you were going to do some recursive directory on, a, on a, a disk drive, and you said, hey, for each folder in the top-level directory, you know, do a recursive drive. There's a real good chance that's not going to help you at all, yeah. right? Because you're going to be throttled by the IOs of that disk drive, which is relatively rare. And so, you know, you're just not going to get, there's only so many IOs, so it's not going to help you. But what would help you is if you had a bunch of disks there, instead of saying, oh, I want to do a recursive directory from down them all, say, hey, I want one for each one of those disks uh, and recursively go down. That would be, you know, be parallel. You'd be able to use all the I.O. available to you. Yeah, anyway. another another great one, I think, is uh, like synchronous deployments, right? So if I'm using yes. Azure PowerShell in a synchronous way to say, hey, go create these VMs, and that, that creation is going to be blocked on the VM being created, like I don't want to wait for Azure to go finish deploying a VM before I tell it to go deploy another VM, right? I want Perfect. all of those things to happen in parallel because my machine is just acting as an orchestrator, really, more so than than the actual computational node. That's a great example, Joey. Let's talk about errors. Yeah, so this was another big one. Uh, it's actually one of my favorites because I, I've been uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, not only want to say bothered, but I haven't been a huge fan of the traditional error view that we've shipped in PowerShell over the years given sort of all the red stuff that gets uh, uh, spewed out to, to the console, especially in the interactive case. So, um, oops, excuse me. So this was a, a situation where we massively simplified those error messages so that you're really just getting the actionable string in those interactive circumstances. For instance, if I ls a directory that doesn't exist uh, or get child item, excuse me, um, then, you know, it's just going to tell me, hey, that path doesn't exist. That's it. That's all I'm going to see. No, you know, no eight lines, not the exception type, all this other stuff. Um, but if I'm actually operating in a script, we now have this very neat format uh, inspired by a couple other languages uh, that, that's going to show you the line and the, and the cursor placement of where on that line the error has occurred. So you're actually getting more information in those contexts where you're debugging longer scripts and, and authoring modules and that sort of thing, and less context in those interactive scenarios where you know you you uh, you mistyped and 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 got the path wrong. Um, similarly, we added this get error commandlet, which is really cool in pulling out all the details of the inner exceptions where you know the actual actionable information is is very frequently located. Um, you know, in the past, you had to do this very kind of belaboring, uh, you know, format list with a, a dash force. And then right, you, know, you try to go find the inner exception. And and then the inner exception has an inner exception. And so <laughs> with this get error, we just sort of say, <clears throat> here's everything you could possibly want. For those of you that are doing diagnosis, don't have to remember all these crazy incantations to just get at the damn error. Right. So yeah. um, big deal. Now. Really cool from the the other side. This is this backwards compatibility, right? So so in the same way that the sacred vow says, hey, we're going to make your knowledge more useful. It's also promising that we're not going to make your existing knowledge less useful, right? And so uh, this has been a, a really, really large effort on our part, but it's one that we've placed a very high priority on because we know that there are so many modules and scripts out there that depend on the existing ecosystem of PowerShell. And that was not something that we were going to walk away from, you know, all these these uh, just really useful uh, artifacts for for Windows PowerShell. So as as we kind of uh, alluded to before, you know, we added this this uh, compatibility layer uh, naming TBD, I guess, uh, <laughs> where, you know, we're we're automatically importing those modules in System 32 that we know to be in, incompatible um, into Windows PowerShell and all seamlessly behind the scenes. You know, we stand up this session, uh, we establish a, a remoting connection to it. 
Um, it's technically happening over, I believe, um, named pipes now. I, I could be mistaken, actually. Uh, so it's not technically a, a remoting call, um, but you know, this is this oh, is basically allowing change? you. I think we did. Cool. Yeah, no, it's definitely because there were some restrictions around the fact that WinRM uh, could not be executed a local yeah. host anymore uh, unless you're an admin. So we're actually and it's much more performant uh, to use the name. I believe it's name pipes. It might be some other kind of RPC. I could be mistaken. Uh, I'm going to get it wrong, but um, we'll, okay. we're happy to go dig that up for you uh, to find out because the implementation is really, really cool. Um, but you know, we, we've also invested very heavily in getting these modules to compatibility. So check out this link. Um, this documentation I've been promising for roughly a year or so to tell you, hey, uh, do you want to use Active Directory? If so, these are the versions of Windows and Windows Server where it has been made compatible. And these are the features, roles, or capabilities that you install it on, um, which is uh, harder than you think to put together, but immensely useful. Um, as you're migrating to PowerShell 7 and, and looking to understand what's going to be natively compatible. So um, definitely check that out. And, and file issues, there's, there's really good instructions on there for how you file issues to let us know about modules that are not yet compatible and that are very important to you. Um, so thank you. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the successes of PowerShell. Now, a lot of this telemetry uh, is publicly available. Um, some of it we're, we're still working in 7.0 to make uh, more publicly available and to merge into those publicly available dashboards. So you're going to see some of that trickling out over the course of the next month or two. Um, but really just want to share with you some of the, uh, you know, th this goes hand in hand with the sacred vow in terms of showing you that as more and more people adopt, learn, and use PowerShell, the ecosystem grows stronger, right? So there's just going to be that many more artifacts out for you, you know, on the gallery for you to consume, that many more folks on Stack Overflow, that many more contributors on GitHub that are that are bringing new features and bug fixes into PowerShell. And so all of this just really points to your, your knowledge of PowerShell becoming more and more useful uh, in a more organic way. Um, so, you know, this is one of my favorite slides to show. Uh, this, this one goes crazy. back all the way to 2017. Um, just can't get which, enough of this. <laughs> I well, and and it keeps making the middle look more and more depressing because there was a time when you know we were hitting, uh, you know, just September 2019 or even you know February 2018 where we're going, wow, we have a hundred x growth, um, and this is insane. So just to to give you a little context, these are the PowerShell six and seven session starts, um, across the last two and a half years, right? So. Um, when we first launched, you know, our beta two, um, we actually had alpha 17. So this goes even further to the left. Um, nobody was using the stuff, right? We weren't seeing, seeing a whole lot of customers just jump to adopt it. But as we work through this long tail of issues and we continue to burn down that module compatibility, um, you know, you're seeing this massive growth. I mean, even, even in March, we had another 20% just slapped right on the top. Um, and, and the coolest thing I like seeing here is that the vast majority of these session starts are on Linux, right? Um, we suspect yeah. that many are happening in containers. Um, we don't have that that level of detail, um, but uh, you know, you're. It's really just it's proving the point that being in as many of these places as possible is what's valuable to our customers. Um, I also like to point out here that the Mac usage um, is a tiny little gray sliver on the top. So folks may say. Hey, uh, if you're interpreting your telemetry, you know, uh, uh, in a very cursory way, wouldn't you cut Mac as a platform? Like, why would you continue to support this thing for less than 1% of your users? But what we found um, is that a lot of those Mac users, the vast majority, are not deploying, you know, these sets of thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of servers, but they are authoring the modules and scripts that are doing those deployments. And so, you know, for those folks that are sitting on a MacBook as their primary workstation, they need to be able to write these scripts and modules, test them locally, and then, you know, deploy them to their Linux nodes or their CI environments or their Windows servers where they're actually going to get executed. So, you know, when I when I go to a conference uh, back, back when we were still able to do them in person, 50% of the machines I see are Mac, right? So we, we have to continue supporting that platform. And regardless of what this data naively shows, we're firmly committed to supporting Mac uh, going forward. Now, this is actually data specific to PowerShell 7. Uh, so one of the things that we added uh, is the right-hand side here in PowerShell 7, which is, um, you know, we generate an anonymous uh, machine GUID the first time you run PowerShell, um, and we use that to track 
how many unique nodes we actually have running in PowerShell. So a node could be a computer, could be a Docker container, could be a VM. Um, but in any case, uh, it, it's very interesting here. You know, we, we don't really have enough data yet to be able to draw a large set of conclusions from this. But, you know, you're seeing, uh, interestingly, more and more of the PowerShell 7 sessions, so the very new version, you know, coming from Windows. But despite that, there are more Linux nodes actually running. So that would imply that, you know, these Windows users are spinning up lots of sessions while a Linux node um, may not spin up as many. Um, and, and, you know, that could be the case simply because you have these interactive users on Windows that are opening lots of sessions. Um, it could be that, um, you know, a Windows server is sort of more long running while a Linux server might be containerized and then get torn down very quickly. You know, we have a lot of theories on this, but, you know, as we drill more and more into this data, we're going to, uh, you know, sort of start to, start to draw some some stronger conclusions that, that can help drive our feature development going forward. And finally, uh, you know, wanting to show some of the Visual Studio Code extension usage. Um, so this is one where, you know, we know very firmly that we can't uh, abandon our Windows PowerShell customers. You know, there's still a, a lot of them here that are running uh, Windows PowerShell with the VS Code extension, uh, it, roughly 75%. Um, but despite that, we're seeing more and more growth in in Linux, in Mac. You know, if you if you look here to the, the lower right, um, you know, this this is not representative at all of that first chart that we showed where where mac is this negligible little sliver below one percent but actually it's six percent of the users um that are that are running powershell six uh, as well as this sliver that's unfortunately unannotated uh so you know probably 10 percent of the vs code users roughly are, are on mac right so um, this is something that we're continuing to monitor. Um, it's what helped us drive the decision to drop three and four support um, in the latest uh, major version of the PowerShell uh, uh, Visual Studio Code extension. So, you know, these are the kinds of decisions we're we're making based based on data and and you know why we encourage you uh, to to not turn off that telemetry so that we can continue uh, to understand you know how how you as a customer are actually using the product so we can make sure to prioritize it for you. Yeah, I got to say the team, I think, did a great job on this telemetry and in particular being completely transparent about what we're doing, what we're gathering. So any information that we have, you have access to it. You can see the code if you want to see, you know, verify that there's no hidden signals or anything like that. It's all there. Um, but that we use this to try and better serve you. That's why we do it. Uh, and I think people have responded very well to that. So again, if you ever hear anybody you know, concerned about the telemetry, Go take a look, show them the data, and then encourage them to, hey, no, the team really does use this to help serve the community better. Please give them all the data you can. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm a very privacy-minded individual, Jeffrey. I'm, I'm a very paranoid guy. I, you know, I lock all my ports down and I double VPN all my stuff and everything. You know, I, <laughs> I'm VPN. very, uh, uh, well, um, we can get into it in the happy hours, but yeah, you can you can yeah. hear about my, my home infrastructure another time. Okay, I'm uh, in. But the... Uh, but in any case, uh, you know, this is something that we we do because it's useful and not to just go scoop up as much data as possible. And, and I thought one of the most interesting uh, aspects of the development process was that as we worked through the RFC to introduce this new telemetry, uh, you know, someone on Twitter linked to this and you saw some of the, uh, you know, kind of negativity around telemetry as a dirty word and folks on Twitter, um, you know, kind of beginning uh, uh, to get a little upset. And then you dive into the RFC itself and you look at the discussion that's taking place with the folks from outside Microsoft that are actually contributing to PowerShell and having to make sort of the same sort of uh, uh, decisions about priorities and about whether to, you know, support a version or move in the, the same direction as something. Um, and those folks were going, can, can we add more telemetry? Uh, it'd be really useful for us to also have this other piece of information. And, and you know, we actually had to play the, the middle guy, which was, you know, going, well, no, we can't, we can't, uh, you know, expand that much into the data collection like that. That is, you know, something that, that makes us a little nervous. But at the same time, you know, we're being privacy minded for these folks on Twitter. So, you know, it's, there's, there's this, this very delicate balance and it's something that we do take very, very seriously. Awesome. You want to tell us about uh, going forward here, Jeffrey, some of the new themes in, in PowerShell 7.1? Absolutely. By the way, and so we didn't mention something I love, my most favorite feature of PowerShell 7. Oh, well, we thousands of little features, right? Yes. So one of my favorite uh, uh, um, uh, business thinkers is a guy, IBM sales guy called Buck Henry, Buck Rogers. And he said that products of true enduring quality are not those products that do one thing a thousand percent better. 
but those products that do a thousand things 1% better. And by opening it up, open sourcing it, getting allowing the, com the community to contribute, to have community maintainers, we were able to get you know, well, I don't know if it's thousands, but lots and lots and lots and lots of little features that just anybody who uses seven will just say, wow, you know, there's just this nice fit and finish to the product. So that's my we, favorite. But we had a discussion. We've been doing lots of these virtual happy hours, Jeffrey, and a lot of the, uh, you know, over teams to, to you know, stay uh, uh, sort of casual with some stuff. Um, but one of the most interesting conversations we were having was about, you know, every once in a while you get thrown into a 5.1 environment as someone that works on PowerShell. Um, and it's just like, I, I can't, like nothing works. I'm, I'm <laughs> using all this stuff. You know, it's like CD minus and CD plus, which is like a little pop D push D helper. Like you're using that all over the place. Or I, I run install module and it says you got to be admin and I have to remember to add the user scope or, or update just help. CD to get just, to your home directory. Yeah, just little, little, little things. But but there's so many of them and everyone had a different thing. That was the yeah. point was that everyone yes. had different stuff that they said they hit every day, you know, when they switched to Windows PowerShell. And it, you know, that, that long tail is absolutely what adds up to a polished product, like you said. Yeah. All right. So 7.1, can, can it get better? Yes. It's uh, hard to believe. So, hey, I'm going to talk to you about the 7.1 wave, and I'm going to talk about Microsoft investments. Wave and Microsoft investments. What's that about? Look. Seven PowerShell is a community effort. It's a community effort. So when we say wave, what we're talking about is, hey, there's a you know a, a series of development efforts that's going to uh, culminate in Windows 7.1. You'll see a lot of the things that we do uh, are shipping in modules before 7.1, uh, and then eventually we'll find its way. And then MSFT investments. Well, again, we're just one member of the community. Uh, other members of the community will be contributing stuff, uh, big and small. So I'm just gonna speak about the things that Microsoft's gonna invest in, but you'll see that the community will invest in additional things as well. <clears throat> so there's kind of four themes that we have. So first is innovating outside of the engine. This is our strategy to deal with scope and going big, uh, improve tooling around PowerShell, improving our RFC process, and then next generation shell. Next generation shell? Yeah, wait to the details. <clears throat> now, innovating outside the engine. So the key thing here is you want to go fast on the things that are low risk and a little bit slower on the things that are higher risk, right? So the, the PowerShell engine itself needs to be stable and safe and ultra, you know, like that's the thing that can break things, okay? So we want to be, be pretty rigorous around that, okay? But there's other things that you can go very, very fast on. Right, so modules, right? If you produce a module and you have an error, it by and large isn't gonna break everyone's scripts. You try and add a new operator and you break something, it can break everybody's scripts. So what we wanna do is we wanna say, hey, we have these streams or swim lanes of, of uh, development and each swim lane can go as fast as it can go while still being appropriate for the, that swim lane, okay? So what does that mean? Modules, modules, modules. Modules allow us to go very fast. We can release them quickly. We can release them asynchronous from the, the main release, et cetera. So we're gonna go big on modules. One of the ones you've already seen, secrets management. I'm so excited about secrets management. And, and by the way, if you haven't seen Sydney, Sydney talked about this at Ignite. I think we've recorded that. <clears throat> she does a fantastic job describing this and she's been leading this effort. So secrets management, you know how passionate we are about security and how passionate we are and how core we are about saying, don't put secrets in your code. Well, it turns out, or passwords in your code, turns out there's more secrets than just passwords. And so people would say, okay, yeah, that's why they have PS credential. Yay, you know, that keeps you from putting passwords in, in your code. But then people put API keys in the code. It's like, guess what? <laughs> API keys are the same thing as a password. And so, well, geez, how do I manage an API key, blah, blah, blah. And so it's, it's hard. 
right? It's hard. And so that's what secrets module is all about. And the idea here is that we'll have a pluggable model because there's lots of different people that have secret stores, but we have the Azure Key Vault, there's local key vaults, uh, AWS has their own. <clears throat> and so we've got a framework where you say, hey, I'd like to get a key vault, uh, a secrets provider, and then I want to store a secret in there and then retrieve that secret by a name. So you store it under name, you retrieve it under name, and you say, okay, now use the value here, dollar sign value, instead of API key, blah. Um, really exciting stuff. Uh, Sydney will walk you through the detail. Everybody, everybody should be using this. Uh, one of the cool things about this module is we're actually gonna make it, how far back are we going with this, Joey? 5.1, yeah, so this is gonna work on Windows PowerShell. You know, we are, are and, and this is another great reason to innovate in modules is that it really does push you to, you know, find that compatibility, right? As soon as we start integrating things with the engine, it's so easy to say, hey, can we just add this one little feature into 7.1 and just make it easier for me to make this module? We go, well, there's going to be a lot of users on 7.0 and there's a lot of users on 5.1. So, you know, let's let's really uh, make a best effort here for, for this to work uh, in as many places as possible. But there is one more thing I just wanted to land um, on, on this specifically, um, which is that this this is sort of the start of an evolution of our thinking where, you know, we're trying to decouple that messy world from these sort of higher level task oriented scripts. And, and the point is that you can use these, these secret management co uh, command, let's like get secret, and you can swap out the back end of where you're actually storing that thing without having to change that higher level script. And so you can have someone that is an AWS customer that has written a script that, that uh, you know, is, is actually retrieving their key from an, an AWS vault but they can hand that to an Azure customer and, and have the Azure customer just configure that secret management uh, uh, module on their, on their own environment to actually pull it from Azure instead, right? So you're, you're getting more of the open source ecosystem collaboration where people who are customers of different technologies and products can build artifacts that actually work for each other. So this is all about you know, taking down those barriers and, and making that world less messy. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's fantastic. Also, Jupyter Notebooks. Now, if you're not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, you will be. I'm so enthusiastic about Jupyter Notebooks. We had hoped to have a few technology things ready for this conference. They're not going to make it this conference. It'll take us a while. Certainly by next year, we hope to be using these all over the place. I got some very big uh, ideas and plans for Jupyter Notebooks. So what is a Jupyter Notebook? A Jupyter Notebook is basically this combination of markdown, so documentation, and then code, and then the ability to run the code and see the results in line. Okay, this is very popular in data scientist worlds. Oh, here's some data scientists, blah, blah, blah. Here's the Python code, run this, and here are the results. So now what we have is, you know, Azure Data Studio was the first to go and say, hey, um, we're going to allow you to do Jupyter Notebooks with PowerShell as an engine. So they go and say, oh, hey, I'd like to get all this data from SQL or from this data store, process it this way, and sh show you these results. So it's inline documentation code results. And then you can go into the code and say, hey, what if I change the number to this? Run it again. What if I change that? Run it again. What if I, with this, run it again? And you see that. So it's a great way to uh, iterate and learn something. So the challenge has been, hey, how do you get the PowerShell into these Jupyter notebooks? And so Jupyter has this notion of what they call a kernel kernel is basically what we, we would call a run space. And so the, we've been working with the .NET team to produce this new .NET kernel. It's called the Interactive Jupyter Kernel. And basically what it is, is it's sorry, sorry the .NET Interactive Jupyter Kernel. It is a version of .NET or .NET bundled in such a way that it works with Jupyter and then can work with a, a wide set. Is it all the the languages, Joey, or just a, a set of them? I I do. It's I think it's C sharp, F sharp, and PowerShell. PowerShell. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's but, power, uh, PowerShell's yeah. the one that matters. I don't they think did they support VB.net. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, so now that's part of that. Anywhere that uses uh, notebooks, Jupyter notebooks, will can now use support PowerShell. So happy days. Sydney is again going to talk about this in her session: notebooks and Visual Studio Code. So. Pay attention to notebooks. They're going to become very, very important. And well, of course, and, and just to, 
if I could if I could tell a brief anecdote, I think that Please. this one is also highly representative of uh, the the sort of way that sometimes sometimes you can be too early on something. Maybe the world's not ready, uh, or that you know the ecosystem around Jupiter, for instance, needed to develop a little more, uh, mm. or or Microsoft needed to to develop around Jupiter a little more. Uh, before we were able to make this investment. But this was something that Jeffrey was pushing uh, me and and some uh, engineers on the team very hard to go and pursue, uh, like probably five or six years ago. Um, and so, you know, you were, you were definitely ahead of the curve on this one, Jeffrey. Um, but it was really awesome that we were able to sort of circle back and, and actually kind of go make that scenario happen uh, once the technology was, you know, ready on both our side and on the Jupiter side, right? PowerShell Core and Seven have made this uh, immensely easier to go and implement as well. So, and, and hey, the reality is to ship is to choose, right? You only have so many things, and if you take a look at Seven, and and um, I think made the right choices. Man, I, I freaking love Seven. So happy days. And of course, the PowerShell team is going to be investing in more and more modules. Hey, tooling. Uh, we got two things focused in on the tooling. First, PowerShell Get 3.0. PowerShell Get is really kind of a hit refresh, an F5 moment on the whole one get based uh, uh, stuff. So this is rebuilt, uh, you know, kind of from the ground up, focused in on speed, simplicity, um, uh, uh, um, and something else. <laughs> speed, simplicity, and I forgot what the other thing was. Anyway, so it's very simple. Um, Stability. There you go. And Sydney again. Well, this is going to be the Sydney conference. Good heavens. Sydney and Amber are going to talk about that in a session called PowerShell Get 3.0. Additionally, of course, we continue to invest in Visual Studio Code. If you haven't used Visual Studio Code, you really should. If you use Visual Studio Code and said, eh, it's not quite stable enough for me, try it again. If you use Visual Studio Code and you said, eh, it's not PowerShell ISE, type, Joey, what's the command? PowerShell uh, ISE mode. Yep, just Control Shift P. Just hop into your command palette and switch to ISE mode. You just type ISE and hit Enter. Easy, it's crazy. You get, the, you get the ISE in Visual Studio Code. It's crazy cool. Colors Those guys and everything. Are, yeah, they're advancing so fast. You just, you know, you. Well, I'm just going to say it. You'd be a dope not to get on board with those guys. They are just going so fast and making such great progress. These are people you want to partner up with. Uh, so Visual Studio Code, just awesome. Oh, and of course, what we're doing is we, you know, we've got editor services. We'll continue to invest in that and script analyzer. By the way, so in the past, some of the challenges were that, hey, if you had a very large module uh, you know, code block, it didn't ran slow in Visual Studio Code, made that a ton faster. Oh, yes. uh, we'll integrate in with script analyzer so that as you're doing it, it's saying like, hey, here's how you write great PowerShell code. So do it in line as opposed to a separate process. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take back over here. I think. Yeah. Um. So, this is really uh, more of the sort of process, you know, base changes, and these are things that you know we've talked about in the past. Uh, we we've mentioned that there are definitely places to improve uh, sort of the development of PowerShell. So, you know, we we've had we've had this massive growth in the in the amount of open source contributions that have been coming in not just in the PowerShell engine, but really across all the repositories that we own. Um, and this is a really great problem to have, right? This is, we owe it to you, our community, for the fact that you continue uh, to just, just bring us issues, code, tests, documentation, written RFCs, all these things. And, you know, we're, we, we're, we're immensely successful in that regard. Um, thank and, you, and thank for those, you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, seriously. Uh, and we'll, we'll continue to thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but you know, for those that don't know, these these review for comment uh, documents (RFC docs) um, are, are essentially specifications that serve you know very lightweight spec that serves as the basis for some of the more complex uh, you know new features that folks want to add to PowerShell, uh, whether it's a language operator or you know a new attribute, something like that. Um, you know, they they give a framework for people to understand the the problem set that's being solved by the feature. Um, the the sort of scenario, uh, a use case of how the feature um, would be used in the real world, excuse me, and maybe some alternate considerations, maybe some downsides to, to that approach. You know, so it really gives the community and us, uh, those of us who sit on the PowerShell committee, a framework for being able to sort of make decisions about how to take the PowerShell engine forward. But the problem is we've got a lot of these. 
and we've got a lot of issues. And as Jeffrey said, there are uh, to ship is to choose. And there are only so many hours in the day that we can, uh, you know, read these things, triage them, respond to them, and also still write code and fix bugs and do all the things that we're expected to do as PMs and engineers. Um, so how do we scale to this growth? Well, first off, we need to give more control to you, the outside collaborator, right? So we tried to understand, hey, we we really care about the the stability of the platform, and we do think we need this strong centralized you know committee as a body to to maintain that integrity and, and stability of the platform. But we can't make all the decisions. So how do we open that more up to these outside collaborators? Um, similarly, you know we needed more decentralization in this decision making. So whether it's an outside collaborator um, or someone who works at Microsoft, um, being able to to have you know, pockets and, and groups of experts that are able to make their own decisions about places where they are experts, those domains um, that they're very knowledgeable about, um, is critical to us being able to, to scale out, right? And then reducing bottlenecks in the process, right? In many cases, we found ourselves in the committee to be bottlenecks to, uh, you know, uh, really moving these designs and features forward, moving the discussion forward, um, when, you know, folks were ready to implement or, you know, maintainers were ready to merge PRs and that sort of thing. And, and you see the same sort of things happen with, with the maintainers as well. It's a very small body of folks, um, you know, triaging issues, triaging PRs. It's very expensive. Um, and so, you know, how do we how do we reduce those bottlenecks um, and spread this thing out? Um, and then, of course, we have to balance that with maintaining this coherent, uh, stable platform. So, you know, one of the things we already mentioned, modules, modules, modules. If it can be done outside of PowerShell, it should be, right? There may be reasons to bring these modules into PowerShell eventually when they're stable. We've demonstrated their value, they're they're popular already, and we'd like to bring them to everyone because they are so immensely valuable. Um, but that doesn't mean that we need to go and build these brand new commandlets or brand new uh, uh, you know modules really in PowerShell itself. But for those features where that's not possible, say we have a language operator, we're going to be leaning more and more on experimental features um, as a way to uh, introduce these things to the preview branch, um, give people an opportunity to turn them off. We've got some strong telemetry around when people turn them off. Um, and then if it's something that's popular, we can leave it in as an off by default experimental feature in our stable branches so that customers can turn them on, thereby demonstrating that uh, you know this is something that'd be powerful uh, uh, and popular for a lot of folks. I think that's worked so, out really well. It has, it has. And we've sort of experimented with experimental features to some extent. Yes. Uh, you know, we've we've dipped our toe in the water in terms of how we do these, but we really think we have a pretty strong framework now for understanding how we can use these more consistently um, and, you know, how we can use these as a, as a really strong signal for, you know, even in those cases where we may want to break, uh, make a very small breaking change, um, you know, kind of understanding whether or not customers are actually impacted by that breaking change because in many cases we're working with incomplete data right we yeah. we don't know if there's someone out there that has stood on their head and thrown three inconsistent attributes on the same function and you know also you know whatever they're doing we we go well we can't think of any reason why someone would do that but if they are we're going to break them really badly so you know we're trying to use these experimental features as a way to sort of mitigate that lack of knowledge Right. So I'm about to flash a diagram up here on the screen. And I want to preface that by saying, don't get your microscopes out. A lot of this is TBD. <laughs> it's going to change. Um, I really just want to sort of demonstrate that, you know, this is something that we've thought very deeply about, right? This new RFC issue, RFC PR flow. And, and at a very high level, you know, on the left hand side, this is sort of the, you know, all this in blue is really stuff happening in issues. And, you know, we, we want to propose these new groups of experts that are going to be the folks that, that are making driving more of the discussion in those issues and making some of the preliminary decisions about whether or not features uh, you know should continue throughout the rest of the process. Um, in purple, we have the aspect that um, is driven largely in code PR. You know, we we found as we had these discussions that prototyping is sometimes a better way to discover whether or not something is going to be a good idea than it is to go and write a big long RFC, right? Sometimes the RFC is, is really too theoretical for someone to understand whether or not something, something works. And so, you know, we found ourselves doing little experiments internally and then going, you know, if I had to write all this out as opposed to just writing some code on a Friday, I never would have gotten to this point where I understood that there was some, you know, design gotcha along the way. Um, yep. And so, you know, we're really trying to give people 
the ability to to choose one or the other that they want to do first and to let that inform you know the other one so if you want to go build a prototype that's encouraged um and if you you know if you want to go write an rfc to develop your thinking further before you write any code that's encouraged as well but the point is that we only get to these very expensive parts of the process once we've had a really good conversation about whether or not something like this belongs in PowerShell altogether. Did so, you advance the slide? Oh, I did, but I didn't, yeah, I didn't take control here. Oh, now I advance the slide. So <laughs> sorry. Uh, we're figuring things out where, you know, it's one, one day at a time in, in uh, Corona times. Uh, so uh, here on the left, uh, again, that's that blue part. That's the, the issue management uh, you know, this this teal part here, the turquoise is is more of a uh, the RFC aspect happening in the committee. Um, and then, uh, you know, this purple aspect is is that, you know, code PR, that prototyping uh, that that, again, we're trying to decouple from the RFC. Um, both will still be necessary to complete the thing. But again, we, we really want to get away from this uh, very expensive aspect of the process when possible. So let me dive into a little bit uh, more detail here. So this is just addressing that left side of the issue flow um, that was in blue. And the point here again is to decentralize the decision making, um, to reduce these bottlenecks, and really to find, um, you know, to, to not waste time on more expensive parts of the process when, uh, uh, you know, we've, we're able to determine that something, you know, shouldn't necessarily progress to that point. So what do I mean? User comes in, they got a great idea, they're gonna file an issue. Right, they're going to give their rationale for why they think that thing uh, should be a new feature or, or uh, you know, a new parameter or whatever, and they're going to give some use cases. Right, they're going to say, "Hey, I was trying to do this the other day, and it would have been really nice if if this thing had been there because it would have greatly simplified what I was trying to do." Right, right off the bat, these experts are going to come along and they're going to say, "Hey, if that can be implemented outside PowerShell, go and do that." Right, you you there are more than enough places that you can you know converse with those in the community, collaborate on modules, you know, publish things to the gallery as previews or, or under your own name, you got your own GitHub repos, go and prove that this is going to work well, that it's useful to people and that it's valuable, right? And if, and if it is, you can come back and make the case that it should be included in PowerShell. Now, if it can't be implemented outside of PowerShell, we're talking about a new operator, for instance, then contributors and this team of experts are going to discuss the value of this proposal, right? Does this thing have merit? Is it something that we think would be useful? Does it belong in PowerShell? And these teams of experts are ideally going to be scoped to certain areas like, you know, debugging or performance or the language. Um, and so they're going to have expertise on that specific domain um, and, and, you know, really give this holistic view of whether or not the thing belongs in PowerShell. And they may have different criteria for making those decisions. Um, but, you know, we'll, we're, we're kind of working out some of that, of those details still. Now, if they say this doesn't make sense, just to assuage your fears, there will be an appeals process where someone can invoke the committee and say, I think the experts are totally out of line here and this is the greatest feature to come to debugging ever. Um, we don't expect that that's gonna be very frequent and you know, we we, uh, we don't expect that a lot of those appeals are, are gonna make it through because we do have a lot of faith in these these folks that we consider experts and we think that they're, they're pretty smart people, but we do wanna have that trap door in there uh, you know, as, as an aspect of the process. Now, at the very end, they say, this is awesome. This debugging feature is going to be sweet. Uh, they're going to ask that the contributor or that someone that's willing to implement the thing, uh, you know, file an, an RFC or not, right? So they may need to go write an RFC. It's a very complex debugging feature. Um, you know, we, we need to understand the implications with the whole ecosystem and the committee still is going to have some say further down the line about whether or not that design makes sense and it may be iterated upon in the RFC, et cetera. But they may also say new parameter, piece of cake, go ahead and you know make that thing happen. And us as the committee don't have to get involved at all uh, and and be that bottleneck uh, to preventing you know this this feature from getting implemented. So yeah, I think there was some confusion on that point, wasn't there? That some people felt that I think that there was this sort of uh, maybe we weren't as clear that just because something is an RFC and just because we say yeah that's coherent with the design doesn't mean it's going to go to the front of our backlog of things for the PowerShell team to implement. Yes. Yes, and and you know generally speaking we are we are not looking to take RFCs that we own the implementations for, right? We we want you to come forward and if if not you then someone else in the community to sign up and say 
hey, this is something that I'm willing to go and implement. And that that pops things up our priority queue. But I'd say even with that in mind, we understand and are sorry. And, you know, unfortunately, this is just the scale that we're currently operating at. Um, but, you know, we, we realize that we have this backlog of RFCs that we've, we've still not worked through that even people are willing to go and implement. But we've made some strides in the last few months. Um, we unblocked a lot of those right as we shipped 7.0. We hope that that was uh, uh, noticed. We're down to one page of RFC PRs, uh, which was a major accomplishment for us. <laughs> um, but again, it's really all about, hey, how many of these, you know, did folks really uh, spend more time writing than they should have, given that experts in that area could have told them that the implementation may not have even been possible, right? And, and those are the sorts of things that we want to avoid because we as the committee can't be experts in everything. And so we don't want to go to that level of depth where we're figuring out if any possible implementation could could actually fulfill what you're describing as an RFC. We found ourselves going to the experts to ask them anyway. So <laughs> why not hand that power over to those experts and and bring more of the community folk into the fold that that are experts in these these different domains? So we'll have more to share. Um, I know this is taking a lot longer than many of you have liked, um, but at the same time, this is something that you know, given the the need for that integrity, the PowerShell platform that we we really have to get right. Um, and and so please please bear with us over time. All right, now talking a little bit about this, this next generation shell. Um, so this is really two major components. One of those is improving the interactive experience and the other is improving the non-interactive experience, right, the scripting <laughs> experience. Um, so on the, on the front end, right, you've got all these awesome stuff coming with tab completion, suggestions, dynamic help. It's all about putting the, the most useful stuff that you need, that we know you need in front of you as you're using the shell. Right. And so, um, you know, we're, we're experimenting with ways to to, you know, give you suggestions based on machine learning, stuff that's context aware, new shortcuts, um, history based suggestions. Jason's going to go into all these with Steve uh, in, in their talk, PowerShell 7.1 and Next Gen Shell. So definitely check that one out. Um, similarly, uh, you know, this there's this automated scripting experience. Right. And there are some aspects where, you know, in, in some cases we're playing catch up. In some cases, we're actually uh, moving the goalposts even further forward. But where Bash, you know, may have done things slightly differently or may handle the execution of native applications slightly better, right? So, for instance, if I'm taking, uh, you know, something that's a little bit more complicated of a, of a parameter, set of parameters around a, an executable like Docker or kubectl, you know, and I paste that into my PowerShell shell, those aren't always going to work exactly the same, right? So how do we bridge the gap on, on making those things work better. And so you can imagine, you know, this is a similar problem to like net.exe, right? And, and it needing to, you know, you have really complex parameters on net.exe um, and the PowerShell parser gets in the way of that thing, you know, pasting into your shell the same way it worked in CMD, those sorts of things, as well as error handling, right? How do we handle exit codes of native uh, applications? How are we uh, reconciling those, those non-zero exit codes with, uh, what we're doing in in PowerShell exceptions and non-terminating errors, right? So um, additionally, there's this long backlog of community contributions, right? We've got the PRs that have already been open. We've got issues in this shell space. And, and you'll see, you know, some of these that are 2017, 2018, 2019 suddenly being popped to the top of the stack in order to fit with this theme and where we're, you know, going to be continuing to drive uh, the sort of next generation of, of shells. So really excited about this. Also want to thank all of our PowerShell contributors. Um, these are a collection of folks uh, that have contributed to PowerShell 7.0 and 7.1. There are a number of folks as well in other projects that have made contributions and many uh, that didn't quite make the word cloud cut. Um, but we we appreciate all of you. Um, you know, we're, we're really, really blessed to work on, on such uh, a, a popular open source project and one that is uh, so embraced and and contributed to uh, by those in our community. Um, you know, thank you as well to those folks that own modules in, out in the ecosystem and that that are contributing to uh, the growth of PowerShell. Uh, you know, in, in in their own repositories or in or in community projects or that run user groups. All of you make PowerShell better. Uh, and, and thank you, thank you so much uh, for everything you do. Specifically, thank you. you. Want to call out some of the community maintainers, Ilya Sazanov. Uh, is an absolute rock star. 
uh, who who helps out with uh, you know tons of the triage and, and maintainership in in the PowerShell repo. Um, we also get some triage help from uh, Stefan Gustafsson, uh, Joel Salo. This is uh, PowerCode and and uh, Vex32. Um, Keith Hill and and Patrick Meineke, our Keith Hill and and uh, seemingly Science on on GitHub are both. Uh, Awesome maintainers for the editor services in VS Code plugins. Script analyzer, Christoph Bergmeister. We're so sad that we don't get to see all of you this year in Europe, but we're yeah. really excited to be on the panels and and talk to all of you. But thank you so much for for really uh, uh, you know keeping the integrity of these these projects solid and and for you know dealing with the sheer volume of stuff that we're getting in all of them. So absolutely, thank you so thank much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can't say it enough. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> It's just a little graph here. I always like to show this one. Um, you know, this just sort of lands how many of these pull requests are coming in. You know, at this point, 54% of the pull requests, over 50% and growing, are coming in for, for the PowerShell engine itself, are coming in from the community. Um, you'll note in the lower left, this is really where we want to start bringing in more of these outside experts um, because we're spending the vast, uh, or, or we are, despite being you know, only 46% of the pull requests being created, we're actually submitting 54% of the pull request comments uh, in, in these things. And so that's because, you know, code reviews are very extensive. We have to be very, very serious about things that go into the platform and in making sure that they're up to the same quality bar that we would expect uh, coming from inside Microsoft. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we want to extend some of that authority to more and more of the folks uh, that are experts in those areas so that we can, um, you know, sort of even even these graphs out a little bit. But thank you for all the <laughs> the issues you file, the issue comments that you file. Um, again, you know, these just demonstrate the sheer scale that we need to address um, and, and why we're looking to, you know, decentralize these things so we can handle all this feedback that you have coming in. So thanks so much. So in summary, PowerShell 7, it's going to continue to make you more productive at your job. It's going to continue to help you on these these at scale cloud and hybrid efforts as more and more resources with more and more mess, more and more complexity is, is getting brought into your world. Um, you know, PowerShell 7 is, is going to be there to help you help you clean up that mess and, and to manage that complexity. You know, we're, we're 20 years in on this thing and the PowerShell 7 journey has really only just begun. Right. We're, we're just getting started. We've got so many ideas, uh, so much left to do. Um, and, and we're just really excited about the next year ahead. And the one after that. And the one after that. And after that. And after that. Huh. Uh, yes, we're, we're still here. Miles, we're still here. Miles to go before we sleep. <laughs> yeah. And indeed, this is, you know, uh, thank you so much to Tobias for setting this up as a virtual thank conference. You, yes. Of course, it's a it's a it's uh, an experiment. I think it's going to work well. And I look forward to when we can be together and uh, have a cup of coffee or share a beer and, uh, and a meal. And, uh, and uh, it'll be great to see you all again. Yeah, and I'll be I'll be uh, there with my beer stein, uh, you know, drinking with you guys for the the panels. Uh, so you know, can't can't wait to see you then, and and we'll uh, we'll share a virtual happy hour here. Have an awesome conference, everybody. <laughs>